Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome aboard to this panel of discussion that we're going to be looking at uh, the aspect of education and uh, we're looking at the future. So basically we're going to discuss education from the time when it begins all the way to the future of the jobs within the country. But also uh, this year we have a phenomenon that has uh, come through that is called COVID-19. So then how does that shape uh, the employment space, but how does it also help shape education? To take you back a little bit, we did discuss uh, during the last year's Youth Summit, and one of the things that came through is that it is hard to accomplish uh, this education with, without making informed decision. And some of the things that we found out is that there's need for mentorship, there's a gap in society in terms of what people learn. But even beyond that, then it was also noted that we look forward to aspects of innovation. How then do we have innovation and more so talking about disruptive innovation? Does the skill that we have uh, inspire uh, the, 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 the job and employment space? What about uh, the technologies? What about the, the future when we look at the work ethic and the agility of the youth that we have today? Ladies and gentlemen, to bring us to that conversation today, we are going to be having a power panelist that is comprising of one Simon Mwangi Kamau. And for information, Simon is more than four years, has more than four years of experience in advocacy and more particularly to rights of persons with disabilities within the community. As you know, it's one of those things that people do not really pay attention to, and especially the policies and laws and frameworks to that effect are not very heavy. So these are an enthusiast who talks more about the rights of persons with disability currently serves as a regional project manager for the professional and fellows program and on inclusive disability. But also joining Simon is Grace Mbugwa. She's a country recruitment manager for East Africa for Options and Education Agency. Grace is enthusiastic about education and that is one of the things that she delves in each and every single day. Besides Grace, we're also going to have Esther Marechana Muturi. Marechana is a young woman who is passionate about education, technology, and community change. And I, I like the bit of technology because then technology is one of the things that we're going to look into very critically today, has it, how it shapes the education. To bring us on board in this conversation, Simon, I'm going to start with you, as I will later on introduce the final uh, panelists that we do have. Simon. Where are we headed to as education? Is the education that we do have today sufficient or is it something that needs to be tweaked today? Thank you so much, uh, Gemma. And uh, just to jump in into your question, where are we headed in education? In Kenya particularly, I can say that, yes, we are headed in the right direction with the change of the curriculum. And uh, as you can see in Kenya, with all the things that we are doing, especially for, for our curriculum and also for our policies in terms of how best can we deliver content in classwork or outside classwork. So as a, as a, as a Kenyan who believes in uh, education which can bring reforms and education which can bring employment, education which can bring change, I can say that education particularly in Kenya, is it, it, yes, I think we have uh, had a lot of barriers in within with the last, with the last curriculum, but uh, moving forward, I can say we are heading in the right direction. Okay. If we are headed to the right direction, somebody who can be able to tell us more about that direction and somebody who gets to interact with the students and prepares the students for the job market. We, Welcome Dr. Dan Irungu. He is currently the Director of Planning and Entrepreneurship in the Daystar University and also Senior Lecturer at the School of Business and Economics in Daystar. He has consulted widely on matters of public and private sector within the development and more particularly in the education sector. Dr. Irungu, do we have the students who are ready for the job market? And does the education that we offer within the system merit that. Thank you. Thank you, DMR, for having me. I'm grateful. Uh, it's Nelson Mandela who, who taught us that uh, education is the greatest weapon that which uh, you can use to change the world. Nelson Mandela is gone, but that stuck with us because it's true. What education 
can be able to do and what education has been able to do is, is, is incredible. It allows people opportunity. Education creates awareness that which cannot be created by anything else. Education allows people to, to, to be able, you know, to develop their, their social status, you know, economics, and, and therefore this is an important discussion. And therefore you ask, uh, are we still there? Are we still at it? Do we have that kind of education that which can be able to create um, that transformation? And, and this is what I would, um, you, know, you know, say at the EMA. Education, eh, for it to be able to, uh, to, 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 to help um, our pupils, you know, the student's body transition from, from class into the marketplace, eh, three things it has to do. Just like any, any model that which works anywhere. And number one, it has to create value. So when you look at education and education sector and what it is that education you know, can be able to do, we must be able to answer that question. Are we able to position value? Then number two, value delivery. Are, are, we, able, are we able to deliver that value sufficiently? The value that which the market is seeking for and which uh, you know, we hope to be creating in our educational institution, are we able to deliver it? And that's part of the reason why uh, uh, Adiema. Uh, when uh, COVID happened, some institutions crossed and they, they have not come back. Uh, and I'm, I'm sorry to say that some of them will never come back, even post COVID. Why? Because, because the way they deliver value has significantly been challenged. Then number three, how do you monetize that value? We call it value capture. How do you capture value? Uh, yeah. so, so for me, for me at DMR, are those three things. Are we creating value? What it is that we are doing in our classes? Is it what the market is looking for? The, the, the students' populations that which we are churning out, um, uh, you know, uh, out of our educational institutions, are they coming out with value that which is desired in the marketplace? But are we also delivering that, um, you know, sufficiently, conveniently, and in a way that which is, you know, acceptable? And then okay. uh, number three, after they have got that, uh, you know, value delivered, can they commercialize? Can they capture that value? You know, when they invested time and they invested, you know, space and they invested resources, can they be able to monetize? When they okay. start to participate in the marketplace, are they able to make, you know, value out of it? Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Grace, just to bring you on board into this conversation, I, I am privy to the fact that you do handle a lot of Kenyan students and you prepare them for, for education uh, stints within the international spaces, but even beyond that, then within the country. That value that Dr. Irungu is talking about, if you compare to those that you see, is it in tandem? Um, thank you very much, Adiema, and uh, also to the panelists. I'm happy to be here and to be part of this session today. Uh, picking on what Dr. Irungu has talked about, the creating value aspect is there even in our education system. And I agree that, you know, we have quite good competitive institutions. But then when you look at the value delivery aspect, that is where I think we miss out. Because most of the students, when they're coming seeking to study abroad, when you ask them the reasons as to why, we have had some that are coming on board and saying, you know what, it's been four years being in this institution where, you know, we are not uh, moving forward. We are not every time we have maybe strikes, we have to go back to class and also repeat a year. And for that reason, they just want to be in a space where they know if it's three years, it's three years and I'm done for. And, you know, I have acquired everything that I need and I have a certificate that I'm confident enough to use it all over the world. But then the question is, when we are, you know, training our students in our institutions within the country, as we instill these values, are we confident enough with also what we offer to them? Are we telling them that by the time you're graduating, say you are a chef or you're graduating as a communicator or a business person, you're ready for the market. And if then you're ready, how comes it's still also very difficult to even intern where you're saying, I want to come on board for free and you know just be able to intern and learn more skills. 
I think that the institutions, much as they are, they are working towards, you know, um, developing graduates that are competitive, we should also instill that idea that by the time you're out of here, you're actually going to be in the market where you can start your business or just go straight to employment rather than, you know, um, um, intern here, intern there, and you, you're thinking you might not confident enough to uh, just go straight to the job market. So most of the students that I'm, I'm, I'm having, you know, visiting our agency, uh, they have this conversation of, you know, even if I graduate here, uh, where would I get the job? And when they go outside the country and they come back here, uh, most of the time, the idea, even from the employer's point of view, is that as long as your certificate is from a university X abroad, then you are more competitive as compared to someone who has brought a local certificate from a local university. But according to me is that if we can insist on this, this value delivery and also just instill that confidence in our graduates, that yes, when you live here, your certificate from your university in Kenya is equally as good as maybe a university abroad. So um, we should start from there. What is it that we tell them even in our class setup from the time they actually leave high school to even choose a course and be able to join in the university? Okay. Uh, Maria, I'm bringing you on board uh, to this conversation. And uh, when the system was coming into place back uh, when the Jubilee government came into power, they did promise uh, the kids, especially in the high school, uh, in the primary school and high school, the laptop and the digital literacy program. Today, we are in a space whereby technology is one of those critical things that is required of a student or somebody who has gone through a learning system. Where and how expansive is the technological space in the Kenyan education system? I think there's a lot of space and it's very expansive for the students because in East Africa itself, Kenya is known to be very tech savvy. So we are growing, the need for technology is growing. But the problem is educational systems, the government, the ministries, they're not growing and they're not adapting as fast as the community is adapting or the students or the schools or the young people. So I think there's a problem there. So there's a disconnect. Okay, the, is there a remedy for that disconnect? Or uh, do we, and how do we remedy that disconnect? Because does it have to keep on being a promise, a promise, a promise, then when the time comes, then we get into a space whereby we are time bad? I think there's a remedy, there's a remedy, especially for younger people. So to be innovative, not to wait for the government to, because we are the people, we are the younger people, we are the younger generation, we understand how much there's a disconnect between the people abroad and the Kenyan system, the Kenyan educational system. We're the ones who understand where we go short or where we fall short. So if we are innovative as young people, rather than waiting for the government, then we can take the lead and then they'll follow us as we innovate and uh, make things for ourselves, yeah. Simon, you did say that there is uh, the aspect of the new educational system, that is the CBC. How does this mean to remedy the educational system that looks at the employment at the, as the end goal? Yes, and uh, as I said earlier, the CBC brings the, the concept of practicality on what we are learning and what we are doing day, day by day in school. And uh, when you look at the future of work in general, there will be a lot of uh, technological changes and uh, the need of new skills. And uh, the CBC is bringing out is a concept of passion where the, the, the child is driven to do something out of passion, out of the skill that he or she wants to learn or to do. And uh, we'll be tapping a lot of potential. And uh, as you look back in our education system, we were doing, uh, even when we, maybe, even when you're looking at, maybe when you are se selecting which course to do in universities, we were selecting and most of us, we, the courses that we, we did, we were chosen for by the government or the, by the government institution which was choosing the courses. So even some of us, we could not be here doing what we are doing. Uh, a very small percentage is doing what you are currently doing because uh, because you chose to be there 
So, but the CBCs bring a, a, a whole range of, uh, of, a new, of, a, of a new concept where a child is looking at education in a more passionate way. In a, in a, there is creation of desire in this new curriculum. And uh, we are looking forward to whereby in the future, whereby, the, the, whereby this education meets the youth of today, the needs of youth of today, but without compromising the needs of future generation. So I can say well, if well implemented and if well looked upon in terms of uh, implementation guidelines by the ministry, it can create new skills and it can create a new wave in terms of innovation, in terms of skills development and uh, creativity. When you talk about passion, one of the things that is uh, credited is that passion hardly pays. You, you work your back so badly and before you see, you, you actually see it paying through. So then uh, are, are we providing a space whereby we are just leading a lot uh, that is going to be frustrated along the line because they want to follow their passion, but not necessarily what the education uh, systems around the world say. So are we, are we telling people that you, you follow your passion, uh, then you will, you will be happy? Or do we need to mold people in accordance to what the, the international and the world over molds gets to? The, the, the curriculum takes care of how we mold this child or how we mold this youth in from the, the onset. But the, the curriculum, what it really emphasizes on is uh, the, it, the education system must be learner-centered, whereby the learner is given a more spacious uh, way in terms of making decisions even giving, uh, and then there's a lot of parent involvement. Because we have not been, as you can see, even in COVID, in, in, in this situation that we are in, you have seen uh, most of the parents complaining about their children at home. They cannot take care of them in terms of even just uh, schooling them at home. Because the, our system didn't involve parent that much. The parents were just pushing the kids to the school, that was uh, the, the, the responsibility was all left by, for, for, the, for the teachers. So going back to what you have asked, this, the whole curriculum create a learn and set and option whereby it's not an option, a, a more learn and set and concept whereby a learner is given, is given more space in terms of choosing what he, he or she wants to do. And uh, also to give him more time and space to try new things and to try what he or she likes or desire to do. Dr. Irungu, one, one of the things that we've known for a long time is that uh, the tertiary level education is about the numbers, it's about the courses, and it's about uh, the, the, the people that comes to associate with the school. But yet, yet in that mix, then we find that there's a lot of theor theoretical learning that is given through. So then you end up with somebody who has done purely theory, 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 theory. When they step up, there is that mismatch between what they've learned versus what is required in the field. How are the universities coming out to shape this? Considering also recently, you know of the reports of so many courses that were said to be defunct. They do not help, yet they have over thousands and thousands of students, but they are courses that are leading you to nowhere. How do we have this as one of the major things that we rectify? Thank you, thank you, thank you, Adiema. I, I know higher higher education and institutions of higher learning, uh, they have been critiqued uh, sufficiently uh, for not um, uh, you know, modeling uh, uh, learning that which uh, uh, matches with, with the marketplace. Uh, and therefore, you know, these conversations of doing, uh, you know, programs and courses that we can, um, uh, you know, don't quite uh, speak to what, uh, you know, the gaps are in, in the marketplace. That has been there. Uh, uh, but, but I want to say, um, Adiema, uh, one of the things that which education does is, is not necessarily uh, to, 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 to model 
and and get uh, you know someone trained in school on uh, something like commerce or or administration and then you are telling them in the marketplace that is what they're doing today you will get people who are doing banking you know rather uh, you know in the in the banking sector in the finance sector but they never did banking they did completely different things I mean, they did, some of them even did highly, uh, you know, specialized, um, you know, courses like engineering, but, but you find them, you know, in that, uh, you know, banking, banking space. So, so this is what I want to say. Even, even as, uh, you know, that conversation builds up about how the, 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 the universities are not, um, you know, being able to bring uh, courses and programs that which matches with the marketplace, we must also be able to appreciate that other than the technical skilling which uh, the university you know, prepares students for, th there is uh, that kind of opening up, an opening up that which tells them after they have graduated with a degree, they must not necessarily go knocking around doors uh, seeking for employment somewhere, but they have gone through an education system that which helps them to believe in them and, and even to have passion and to believe in, 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 in the abilities that which God has put in the inside of them. So they go through an education system that which helps them to, to believe in themselves. You know, so that, so that even when they are having challenges, uh, like, you know, inequality, you know, inequality challenges, eh, they can still be able to, you know, have a voice that we speaks inside of themselves and tell them they can still be able to, you, you know, to progress. But coming now to the curriculum, uh, it's true, it's true. You even got some courses being phased out. Yeah. And how does that conversation happen? Yeah. How that conversation needs to happen, it is to get the academia and the marketplace and the industry. There is no creation of a curriculum from the scholarly side alone. Uh, you know, you know, you know, sometimes, sometimes you get the market complaining. And and they should because, uh, I mean, you know, when you get uh, the graduate chant there and, 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 you know, the market is saying they have to, like, uh, you know, get them, you know, do the baby, baby steps, it's not good. But, yeah. but you see, how we strengthen yeah. our economies th through the benefits we get from class is through initiatives like this. You know, when we get, um, you know, innovation hubs, innovation centers, where we, we, we get convergence of the marketplace in academia, and you can have open conversations. How can we shape this course differently? How, okay. can we, how can we leverage on innovation and creativity to be able to develop and build better curriculum, you know, for, our, for, for ourselves? If you would allow me, Adiema, uh, to, you know, briefly, uh, uh, you know, add on what uh, Maria uh, said because uh, it is important and partially maybe, you know, uh, it contributes to what um, uh, you are asking me here. You, you asked Gosh. Maria, are we, are, we, are we doing well in, in technology, in, uh, in innovation, in creativity? Have we been able to create that uptake as universities? And Maria said, and I want to, to, to say the same thing, uh, universities are trying. If with COVID, you are having some public universities doing school, okay, with struggles though. If with COVID, you are having some public universities uh, doing exams, with struggles though, but you know, doing it. Uh, of course, you have got some other public university, other private universities like, um, you know, uh, DESA University, uh, the university that which, um, you know, I work for, you know, which has been on online programs and therefore, you know, sufficiently they have been able to plug into that space. Uh, so, so th there is some effort that which is happening. The challenge that which we have uh, at DMA is on uh, infrastructure. And I can tell you for sure, that infrastructure, that there is a lot of it that which uh, not universities alone can do. It is the okay. role of um, you know our leadership, the, the government. Let me give you an example. There was a, there was a story which was aired in one of our national TVs. It was a sad story about um, uh, a fifth year student doing medicine who was covered, you know, captured somewhere, uh, having cows, you know, cattle somewhere. Yes. You know, and, and she's doing, I think he's doing, um, you know, medicine or, you know, uh, uh, you know, in surgery. Uh, so th th that is, that is a university student, fifth year. But you still have got a grade one student, a pupil, 
at Todra somewhere doing classes every day. And they are having interactive sessions. Now, these other students who is uh, in the university, they cannot access data. They are not, you know, there is no infrastructure that which allows them to be able to access classes. I mean, so when you look at that, um, what does it tell you? We are doing well, but you know, as a country, as a continent, of course, we are we, we are a developing country. We 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 are we are we are in Africa. We, we are growing, and there is a lot of hope for us. But the approach um, must be very very joint. You know, we must be able to see how we create synergies. We get the investors here. We get we, we get the private sector here, the public sector. Then we get the government come on board uh, and facilitate the right infrastructure that we, um, you know, would be able to uh, make that happen and learn well. Okay. So, Maria, that combination of the government, the private sector, and the institutions, do we have a disconnect to the effect that universities can haphazardly wake up in the morning and decide that we are going to train this or we are going to offer this course, yet the market does not demand for it? And if that is the case, then where does this leave people who are yearning for education? I think there's definitely an, a disconnect, just as Dr. Irungo has said, because everybody wakes up and they decide to do things on their own. So there's no synergy between um, different sectors, different industries. I think the only way we can do it is by being vigilant, taking initiative. If you're in a university and you see something is not right, what course we're being offered here, we don't have enough facilities for it. Don't keep quiet. Don't expect that the government will come fighting for you. I think initiative from people, that's what is really lacking in our country in general, just in different industries. So if I, as a person, can, can say the university that I live next to is offering 20 courses and it has one class, then we can be whistleblowers in our own different ways. Yeah. So if, if we say that people then should rise up, yet Dr. Irungu says there is lack of infrastructure. So imagine if there is lack of infrastructure for an institution, how much more can that lack of infrastructure be for an individual? Maria, back to you. Still. Yeah, I ag yeah, yeah, I agree. There's, a, there's, such, there's such a disconnect with infrastructure. Some have too much, others have too little. So, and it's just unfair, it's the unfairity of life. But I think if just one person can make a change. If I say my neighbor doesn't have a laptop and he comes from a public primary school and I, I give him my laptop, even if it's for two hours and you do the same and somebody else does the same, then with time we'll just notice that this small change, small change causes a ripple of change. Because if we say we wait for something magical or something big to happen, then we'll wait forever, yeah. So much. Uh, for, yes, Dr. Rungo, you want to chip in? Yes. Uh, uh, no, 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 sorry. Uh, you see, it's because of curriculum and, and, and because that's also the space we are in. Uh, you yes. know, Maria says it right. Uh, you see, uh, how curriculum development happens, it does not just happen. Uh, okay, well, well, if, if, you are, if you are to follow the, the guidelines and the standards and the practices of how you develop a curriculum, there, there is supposed to be a nexus between uh, uh, the curriculum developers, say the university and the marketplace. And indeed, those are the practices that which, um, uh, you know, obtains. Uh, when you look at um, uh, the, the regulatory body that which uh, looks at uh, the quality, audits the quality of education in our country, uh, Commission for University Education, CUE, they have got guidelines. You know, they tell you when you are developing curriculum, uh, uh, you know, in the stages of curriculum development, one of the things that which you are supposed to do it is to get the involvement of the of the industry, and and yeah. and, and I agree. Sometimes you know that doesn't uh, you know always happen, but sometimes even when it happens, um, uh, you know we, we are not able to you know sufficiently be able to you know plug in well. There is something called uh, commercialization of education. Yes, uh, you see, yes, talk about you see, it. At the MM, there is, there is something about education which is about public goods. That's the reason why responsible governments 
you know, anywhere in the world, they will still finance programs which if they were supposed to be learned at private commercial level, you wouldn't operate them because you are thinking they don't earn much commercial value. So even when um, we talk about, um, you know, those courses, that which, uh, you know, would be said to be, to be, to be superior, we also have yeah. to be careful. You know, dear man, we grew up in, in a time when um, uh, the course, if you are to do a course in a university, you know, uh, you know, you know the parents. Uh, you, 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 and me now. You see, we, we, we have got several, you know, years than Simon, uh, my yes. fellow uh, panelist. <laughs> you know, exactly. Yes, that is true. You know, and innovation has done, which is different. You know, you know, at the when you were growing up, um, there are a lot of uh, you know progressive courses happening today, which are, were not happening, you know, at the time. Uh, so, you know, if it was a cause, it was BCom, it was medicine, it was engineering, it was law, you, you know, that kind of a thing. B yes. But, but, but uh, when you look at program like, uh, uh, you know, curriculum based, uh, uh, rather, you know, you know competence based uh, education, CPC, yes. what um, my fellow panelist Simon was talking about, uh, you know, you are saying invest in a curriculum where you are allowing uh, the participant to learn skills and competences. So if, yes. the, if the skill was writing, don't even move them to the next level of education until they have acquired that skill of writing. If it was reading, until they are able to read. I mean, it's not about curriculum. I mean, it's not about syllabus and coverage. Of course, that is important. Okay. Uh, but, you know, acquisition of uh, skills and competences. So Okay. I'm going to hold you to that thought and I'm going to bring Grace and later on Simon to this conversation so that we do not run the risk of being told we are only discussing tertiary level education. From March, when it was said that COVID has been the first patient we have in Kenya, we have an education system that was halted. Later on, there were hopes that it could be uh, started over again, and so far nothing. So we now have our whole year scrapped off. The latest information was that they are not even sure if schools are going to resume in January. Do we have a situation whereby education is not taken seriously? And if it's not taken seriously, how then do we offer the pupils and the students who are at home yet they are looking forward to the job market but they have a whole year and they are uncertain of how their future is going to be grace i'll start with you um thank you adiema allow me to bring in what simon talked about passion dr irungo also touched about passion and I'm going to uh, pick that from where I, I sit and discuss with the students that come to see me, the career guidance that we're having. You see, I like to, to put it in two ways. There is passion and then there is the interest. Passion does not die as long as you're there. And that's why you find somebody can live even up to 80 years, but they still love maybe to knit or to do that one thing, if it's uh, reading books or writing poetry or something like that. To me, those are more like passion. Then the interest comes and goes. And that's why you have somebody, 10 years you're a banker and then you quit and you go to farm. And then you farm and later on you say, you know what, I'm going to now open a shop and sell something else. These are interests that come and go. But then we go back to what is the traditional belief of a successful person? What do we believe is success? Parents from the word go, when a child is growing, they're like grow up to become a doctor or grow up to become an engineer or grow up to become, you know, a, 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 an astronaut. And all these, yes, they are good courses. But then you might find a student that they have uh, another skill other than what the parents want them to become. So most of the time you find that people are afraid to even bring out their inner selves and the things they love because that's not what they have been encouraged to become. They are being told to become something else. And therefore, as you're studying and working hard, even in school, they are insisting on you becoming, you know, that doctor, that engineer, and there is no problem with it. 
But until we understand also that even as we are, we are bringing up this child and even as we are engaging with them, even in classroom setups and at home, we need to allow them to bring what is inside of them, their passion. If it's reading, buy them those books and let them read. If it's becoming a photographer, allow them to be. I mean, five years ago, if you told a parent that their child, uh, if a child was to tell the parent that I'm interested in maybe, you know, dealing with social media or taking photographs, they would look at you and say that's not a course or a career. But look at us now. In the future of COVID, actually, the people that are earning majority is actually people who are in social media content, uh, setups, people who are actually able to market from Facebook, market from Twitter. And all these are things that before they were looked at as, you know, it's not, you're not there yet. Until you wear a white coat or until you wear that helmet and go to the field, you're not turned as someone who has succeeded. So we need to break that, that, that notion that for you to be called successful or for a student to grow up or, or you know, be told that you have now excelled in life, you have to yeah. have you know, a, 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 um, something put in front of your name. Uh, Dr. So-and-so, engineer, so-and-so, and it's good. For the ones who are able to achieve that, that's okay. But for the ones who are not able to, let's embrace them. Then how do we embrace them? If it's vocational setups, uh, institutions, let's set them up and allow them to go. If you want to become a chef, study for two years or one year and then go to the market and become a chef. If you want to, you know, become a hairdresser, let's insist on these courses as also very good courses and, and, and things that can allow them to become an entrepreneur even as they're graduating to start their own business. In, okay. um, in, in, in the line of work that I mean, the students that have sent abroad to actually study trade, trade courses, for example, uh, uh, um, hairdressing or, or even um, uh, arts, uh, culinary arts and things like those hotelier, all these are, are people that, that are, you know, are succeeding and giving us testimonials later on to say, I'm enjoying what I did. It is not really a four year course. I've done it for 18 months and I'm done and I'm happy. And so when you come back here, a graduate from Utali maybe will tell you, I'm still looking for a job because people are not really looking at her like you have succeeded. So we need to, uh, um, na to train and teach our, our, you know, our children that there is, there is more to life and their passion can also come out and their interest uh, to create a career for them. Simon, yes. Yes. Our, Thank our, you. Kids, our kids are not going to school. And they're not going to go to school until next year. And even next year in January, we are not certain if they're going to go to school. Sure. So where does that leave us with this goal of wanting to develop our students from the very first time they get into education system all the way to employment? Yes. So in the beginning of our conversation, I said we are heading to the right direction in education. But uh, in education, the way you look at the education system in Kenya, we have beautiful concept to have a good uh, policies in education, but the implementation is always slow. And uh, yes, we are moving on, we are progressing, but then COVID came and COVID is here. So our kids from tertiary to uh, high school to lower level, they are at home. So what is the government doing and what are we hoping them to do? So what we should be seeing now in Kenya is a behavior of activity in, from, the lower from the lower level of education, that is primary, secondary up to tertiary, a behavior yeah. of activity in terms of of infrastructure in terms of creating more space, in terms of having booth, sanitizing booth, in, in terms of maybe digging boreholes in school where there is no water. But there is none which is being done as per, as per the moment. So what is the future of education in and looking at COVID? Because when you look at COVID, this is a new normal, which is here for some time. And as uh, Maria said, in terms of education, in terms of technology, yes, we have a, a good space to, because as Kenyans, we are tech service. But then again, you see, in terms of technology, we failed because yeah. we didn't provide laptop. Yes. And, and then as you look at uh, schools, even at, from primary level to tertiary level, 
school as safe space for our kids. Yes. As you can see in Kenya right now, we have a lot of teenage pregnancies. According to UNICEF, there's a, there's lies of GBV, and there's a lot of uh, child child defamation cases. Our kids are not safe out there. Our youth themselves, they are not safe out here, out of school. So what we are looking at is a is a dent in our in our education system, a dent which our education ministry is not in any hurry to look at or in any hurry to solve in terms of a crisis. So as per now, what we can say we're in a crisis in terms of education because we cannot see any infrastructure because we need to get our school, our kids back to school. We need to get our youth back to, to the universities, back to, back to colleges. So what we are now, we are in a crisis and uh, the government, because the government has its own mechanism, is own is 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 own institution which can deal with this. Until it act up and uh, solve this, we still be in a crisis. And even our future, because when you look at the teenage pregnancies, that will create a gap and a huge future challenge in terms of when you look into in terms of even public health in terms of delivery of services, in terms of uh, the situation, in terms of even jobs. Yeah. It's a crisis when you look at it in a, in a whole point of view. Okay. Yeah. Dr. Irungu, so let me take you back to the disconnect that we, you said and you even noted. And I think uh, I am very certain, not even think, I am very certain that this is something that you've noted even in your class. So. Is it high time we began conversing with our students in a, in a different way and telling them that let's not go for big name courses, but let's have our whole um, thought shift whereby we get to courses that we are passionate about, but even beyond being passionate about them, we need to start being job creators as opposed to job seekers. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Adema. Uh, job creators and, and not and not job job seekers. I I I I I love you know uh, what uh, Grace is uh, positioning. Uh, what skills uh, you know based uh, uh, training and uh, are able to do in the lives of people in terms of quickly uh, you know helping them to to gain. Uh, you know, attraction, especially in an economy like ours, which is which is a growing, which is a growing and a developing economy. Uh, um, uh, Adiema, uh, not everyone, not everyone will have a space in the blue collar, just like in the white collar collar jobs. If you looked at the statistics that we, uh, I think that's the most recent statistics that we, um, you know, we, we got from World Bank. Uh, the level of uh, unemployment uh, in our country starts at 40%. Um, uh, uh, if, that, if, that, if that's Kenya, then uh, you know, it tells you how the statistics are like in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, if you would pick the youth, youthful population, then uh, you know, it, it, even becomes, it, even becomes, it even becomes worse. Uh, but but uh, that said that said uh, um, Adiema would not suffice for not you know having our our youth uh, you know get into into schools it it wouldn't stop them from from doing that but but the question that which we must boldly ask and the question that which we must have courage to ask uh, is a question is a question which you are asking after I have done a BCom. After I've done a BCom, does that one necessarily transition me from, um, you know, moving from class into an insurance company, you know, to become an underwriter there, you know, to become a banker? Can I do a BCom in class? And that BCom transitions me into starting a small enterprise. A am I am I am I doing school that which is not only giving me technical skills, but also a mind shift, 
you know, I, I can tell you, I can tell you, uh, 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 Adiema, it is easy in a conversation to quickly point to the education system. But, but let me tell you how broad that is. If you look at the other side of things, you know, uh, look at the cycle, look at the education cycle. It has got pallets, it has got guardians. There are those pallets, there are those guardians. They will do what they can do. They will sell what they must sell yeah. to ensure that uh, the, 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 their children have got a degree. And it's not a bad thing. I mean, you know, you know, parents would wish to have the best, uh, you know, for their children. It's the right thing to do. But, but that conversation that which starts to now, you know, uh, uh, start as, you know, engage and say, you can do a degree program. You can do a diploma program. And after you have got that, there is nothing wrong in you setting up um, a clothing at micro level, clothing shop, learning an M-Pesa. There is nothing wrong in, in, in you, you know, scaling up from there. There is nothing wrong in me as, as a business, uh, you know, uh, lecturer, getting uh, an entrepreneur who is only learning, uh, you know, uh, a small store to come and address, uh, you know, my students in class. Uh, you yeah. know, so that when I'm getting, um, uh, you know, the guest lecturers, they must not necessarily be uh, managing directors and executives uh, in corporate organizations. It's a might see, uh, you know, shift. It, it yeah. is not just, you know, it's not just, um, it's not just one-sided. I, I can tell you, uh, you know, a DMA. That turnaround, that which you are going to achieve as Africa, as a country, and, and you will achieve it. It will happen around our youthful population. Uh, you remember, Diema, there was a time when, uh, uh, you know, this country, uh, our country, our, our countrymen, our people, us, the Kenyan people, we were voted as the most enthusiastic, uh, you know, people in the world. You, you remember that? And, and therefore, uh, you know, we, we would we would even want to uh, to let our 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 youth know, even when we have got gaps, that which we must collect in our education yeah. system. I mean, you know, sufficiently we must be able to to do that, uh, because because uh, you know we also want to prepare people for something. I mean, I mean, it is not interesting. It's not funny when you get people, you know, go through, you know, years and years in universities and colleges and they finish their school and they think, um, you know, they, they don't contribute uh, to what the needs are in the marketplace. So this is what I'm saying at DMA. It is a might shift. It is a shift of might. You know, that which moves us into becoming, uh, you know, creators. When you see universities like Dead and Kemadi University, you know, becoming a center, for you know, uh, you know, developing PPEs is a great thing. You know, the innovation may not necessarily be, for, you know, at a very great scale, but it's a yeah. great thing. You, you, you are saying there is a participation which is, I mean, there is something happening in class. We're and getting somewhere in the market. So, so it's yeah. a good thing. It is, uh, you know, it is interesting uh, 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 to to see what Grace is doing. And, 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 and when, you know, she's pressing, uh, uh, you know, people uh, who are going to, to do school in abroad, it would also be good to get our Tari graduates. You know, they didn't necessarily, not everyone will have an opportunity to do their education abroad. How do we make, uh, and it's a good thing. No, 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 no. Uh, I'm not saying there is anything, you know, wrong <laughs> I with that. I understand that. Yes, yes, yes. Even what we are, you know, what you are doing locally, you know, what you are producing locally. Uh, we, we, we must then be able to walk that path and walk that journey, th that which ensures that when Irongo is doing his, you know, his class, and not only at class level, at policy level, at regulatory level, at industry level, we can be able to prepare, you know, our populations, um, you know, for what uh, uh, the market the market is looking for. But, but something also okay. very important at the end. Okay. You know, there is something called value-based education. Value-based yes. education. Yes. And, 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 and I can tell you, uh, um, uh, universities, uh, basic education, tertiary, you know, secondary school, primary school, people have started to, appreci to appreciate the place of value. Value-based education. 
this disease which we have for corruption, for stealing, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you know, the money, you know, uh, the public money. It is yes. not people who who are without school. I mean, education. It's people with good education. It's people who went to good schools. <laughs> it is people who are having this conversation here. It is people who understand something. Uh, you, you know, uh, so, so what I'm saying is, uh, is, is a whole mind shift. It is a high time we start getting, uh, you know, our religious institutions, walk into educational facilities, uh, teach yeah. morality, you know, ethics, yeah. uh, the place of value, the mentoring, uh, you know, organizations like now, you know, what we are having here. Uh, yes. uh, let's get institutions start for something which is not just scholarly, value. Ethics, morality, it means, you know, something in our system. Thank okay. you. For a moment, when you're talking about ethics, values, and I, th I almost thought you were talking about you're blowing the trumpet for Daystar because that is one of the things Daystar is known for. Uh, as we start to wrap this conversation, uh, Maria, I'd want us to look at, uh, yes, we did say that um, there are some technological advancements that are, really, really critical and they have been there. They are, shaping the sh they, are, they are shaping up the educational sector and transforming the nation. Uh, is there something more that needs to be done? And if there's something more that needs to be done, what is your hope and how should they do it? I think there's a lot to be done. Actually, I think too much to be done. So I think the, the, the good thing that we can do is benchmarking with other countries, especially with their educational systems. You, you know, benchmarking I is one of, the, one of the ways of this, eating. Just money, looking right? online at what other countries are, are doing and like going to that place. But for me, it's just maybe online because the internet has made things so much easier. Just looking at some educational systems are exemplary. So looking at what other people are doing and implementing it in our own special way as Kenyans. We can do that and make a change. And also collaborations between different people, like we are here as panelists, like the Youth Engagement Society. Collaborations are good because then you hold somebody else's hand, somebody that, that doesn't have finances or the technical know-how. So I think there's a lot to be done, but we have to be vigilant and we have to take initiative, yeah. Okay, so uh, Maria says that we need to do benchmarking but not the benchmarking for eating money. We need, we can even do it <laughs> online so that then we do not eat, eat, eat uh, the public's money. Um, Simon, do you have hope and are there spaces that need rectification? And if they are, what are those things that must be rectified so that then we have an education sector that is leading and is in tandem with what the job market requires. Yes, just before I, I answer you and Adema, I wanted just to contribute a, a bit on the, the, theory, the theory question that you asked Dr. Irongo. Please go ahead. Yes, that our youth always complains that the reason why they are not in the employment sector is because there is too much theory in our in our education system than uh, the practical the practical thematic areas in all levels of education. And uh, I agree with what Dr. Irongo said, but again, I want to shift that uh, the practicality of education. To uh, as youth, I'm a youth, I'm a youth, and uh, I will say that uh, as much as we, we wish to create a platform for us, maybe to intern somewhere, maybe to volunteer somewhere in a in a in a company, we need to take that responsibility as youth to create that platform. For example, for me as Simon to be here where I am. It was all because of personal, personal and individual initiatives. Because I come from um, a community service sector, I started doing that when I was in my in the universities, and I, I started practicing what I was being taught in terms of because I've learned on disability area. I started 
practicing what I was taught when I was in my second year. I started creating my own my own initiative, my own networks when I was I was still in school. So as youth, also as much as we want to we want to our career guidance office to create platform to plan internship opportunities, and there's this big discussion currently in Kenyans youth in terms of what should you choose between exposure in an employment or being paid for a short time instead of exposure. So people, many youth, they are still in that conflict. Should I just give my skills for free and be exposed to how things should be done in a, maybe in my area of study or in my area of expertise? Or should I be wait for a paid opportunity? So for me, I always, I, always be for exposure because exposure as much as people are saying we are not really valuing the skills that youth are offering because we are speaking to the youth because okay. yeah and again uh, as you asked what are what are our what are our electrification for our education system i'll say as i said earlier as much as we wish to know what others, to, as much as we wish to compare, to have a comparative study on what others are doing, Kenya's, has, Kenya's education system had already done that. We have compared and we have learned best practices, best strategies on how best we can educate our youth. What we all need is just to implement. We have beautiful policies, as I said, we have good expertise in lighting. But yeah. what we need to do is implement. That will be my only solution. Implementation is uh, coming from your end. That is one of the things that we do lack as a nation. And the moment then we get to implement some of the policies that we have, uh, Simon says that we, have, we will have a very robust educational system that leads us to better job opportunities. Uh, Grace, as you wind up your conversation, say what are some of the changes you'd love to see within the education system all the way to employment space and how then will they be effective to ensure that we get the best outcomes? Um, having studied locally actually, I long for a time when we as uh, students who went through, you know, the Kenyan education system, graduated from local universities, along for a day where we say all of us are in spaces that we are creating job, uh, jobs for even our colleagues who are behind us as you exit, even as early as fourth year or even third year. I long for a day where somebody does not have to panic. The thought of graduating is already scaring you because you're like, here comes me, Tamakin. It should be here comes me graduating so that now I can pave way and create, you know, more employment opportunities such that by the time the person that I left maybe in second year or first year, they can be able to come and I can be able to employ them. And also universities, they should hold the hands of their students. After school, how are they doing? What is the graduate employ employability levels that they are, you know, recording from their students that were there before. How do they then do this? They need to partner with companies, pull the companies in and tell them, if it's an industry for IT, you say, can we, this class, towards their final year, be able to you know, come to your, to your spaces at, at your companies, train from there, or rather, can you bring someone from your company to come and train them and they have like an intensive course and then provide a networking space for them so that by the time they are done, they have also connected with some people and they can be able to get a job that way. I did get the opportunity to um, visit one institution in Australia. And uh, one of the sessions that we had there as education counselors, we went to a session where it was a dinner organized for the students who are about to graduate from a hospitality industry. 
Now, they had people from the hospital, hospitality sector within that town coming in for the dinner. And what was happening was a networking session where the students who have studied uh, hospitality, they were serving us and giving us food. But at the same time, they were collecting cards and having conversations. And I can tell you, by the time we were done with that dinner, I think 90% of them had been told, Monday you report here or you send me your CV. Now, for me, that is a network that is possible locally here. We don't have to have companies that, you know, are, are calling for, for, for skills from abroad, yet we have our very own here. When you look at the news, some days you wake up and you're seeing people have invented, somebody has tried to even build a chopper here or, or a gadget here. We have smart people in this country. And the, the day that we utilize the, the, the brains that they have, I think will create a very beautiful country for ourselves. Now, even if you're not able to study abroad, Still, when you're studying locally, building that network, like also Simon said, it is important. Much as you're also having exposure, you also need to work on placing yourself in a setup that can also give you some income so that it doesn't lead again to desperation where you're saying, I am jobless and this is going to be my life for the rest of my life. Mentally okay. also, we need to stabilize ourselves and think about you know a job that is uh, creating creating uh, building ourselves to look for a job and also create a, a job in and with the skills that we have. So yes, we um, we are heading the right direction at Diema. We are not there yet, but we are heading there. If we have even sessions like this where we can speak uh, openly and say what we think matters. Yeah. When I grow up, I want to be widely traveled like you and attend networking dinners. Uh, Dr. Tari, um, as we come to the end of this conversation, uh, when you finally speak then, I'll ask David to come on board, but on an ending note, you've said that there are opportunities that are there. There are also the challenges that are there, especially on the infrastructure bit of it, yet we do not lack the technical uh, capability. There is capability. So what do you hope to see within the system that would be able to pass to the next stage that is required of the country, but also its citizens in the education space, but also in the job employment space. Thank you, thank you, Adiema. Um, for everyone who is participating in uh, the education space, Adiema, we, 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 we have a great uh, example of uh, a great educator, someone we can borrow or live from. His name is Jesus Christ. He was a great teacher. Every time he taught people and his teaching was making them. So when he was recruiting the disciples, he calls them and tells you, I'll make you fishers of men. But when he was dispersing uh, his disciples, he also tells them, go and make disciples. Everyone who is participating in the education space, um, we have got a duty. We have got a sacred responsibility to make. Whether it is at that junior level of our, uh, you know, uh, you know, young, uh, you know, babies in, uh, uh, you know, lower levels, whether it is at uh, 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 secondary level, whether it is at university level, whether it is at uh, even corporate level, national level, we have a duty, and we owe this country, we owe this continent that. For the for the young people who are listening to this conversation and they are in and they are in schools and some of them have even graduated and, and and they are part of the statistics that which you may be talking about here and they always every day listen to that narrative of um, you know unemployment uh, and lack of jobs this is what i would love to tell them there is always something you can do and it is the truth. Start from where you are. I'm very proud with Simon. You know, when Simon says when he was in second year, he could start to walk the journey of, you know, community, you know, disability, something, uh, you know, doing what he, there is always something that which our students can do. 
if you cannot create a platform, create a cow. If and, and I'm serious, I'm I'm completely serious about it. If you cannot participate in this, um, you know, modern technology, create a rabbit somewhere. You, you know, um, Adema, in this country, uh, we have a bad thing called uh, big man syndrome. You know, big man yeah. syndrome. Yes. When people only want to be associated with big things, and they don't want to, uh, you know, to do little things, they don't want to do small things. It is very inspirational when you get our youth take a personal responsibility. You know what Simon is talking about there. When yes. you get the story of a youth who finished, um, uh, you know, a JK Watt, a degree from JK Watt, uh, and they, you know, for a year, they couldn't get placement and they slowly start doing, uh, you know, rabbits. And today, created a whole rabbit farm, you know, doing value addition around there. There are youth who are doing, uh, you know, agri business, they are doing farming. I have seen youth uh, who are doing, you know, beekeeping, they are doing honey. They are doing, you know, you know, they are doing value add around agribusiness. It is time, it is time for for you to also get to that place where they, they, they can say, if we have no one to help us, we will be our salvation. We will help ourselves. And there is a place we can always begin. And completely one of that place also is an opportunity like this, networking. You know what Grace has said yeah. is a great thing. If we yeah. create opportunities to network, especially between, you know, what is happening in academia and the marketplace, you know, innovation centers, innovation hubs, you know, I hubs where students can be helped to, you know, come pitch their ideas, the innovations, they are taken up, they are supported to scale, it would be a good thing. Okay. Thank you, Adiema. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your incisive analysis on the education sector, but also not just looking at education, we are looking at it all the way to employment. And one of the things that comes through is that the education that we do give today is not entirely past supposed to lead you to the job office or to lead you to a white collar job. But you can also get to be innovative enough, be it technological wise, or be it agribusiness wise, or be it in any form that God given wisdom had given on you. Ladies and gentlemen, there is diverse opportunity, but even amidst the challenges that we do have, there's always that ray of hope. But when you see that flicker of hope, that ray there, is it possible that you can clutch on it and follow it through? I thank you so much, Dr. Irungu. I thank you so much, Grace. I thank you so much, Simon. And Maria, thank you for your time and giving us all your opinions. For you who is watching, this is your opportunity. Please kindly give out your insights further or ask the questions that you think would be able to spur this conversation further. But even beyond that, then you could also leave questions that we keep on thinking and brooding about to offer solutions because I can tell you that solutions is not one definite thing, but it keeps on recurring over and over again. Thank you and follow this conversation through. Asante Nisana. <laughs>